Uh, well, um, as people start to continue to file in, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Christian Dawson, and I'm executive director of the I2 Coalition. I2 Coalition stands for Internet Infrastructure Coalition. We are a trade association that makes up the companies that build the infrastructure of the internet. These are the companies that rack and stack servers and data centers and sit above the telco layer and below the content layer. So the, we're, we're the people that make the fabric of the internet work. Uh, and our job is to try and build a singular voice for uh, those companies, particularly on issues that uh, make sure that the internet survives and thrives. We wanna make sure uh, that people understand how the internet's infrastructure operates so that when they are attempting to legislate, regulate, et cetera, that they have a firm understanding of, of how uh, our companies do what we do in order to uh, provide people with the technologies uh, that they utilize on their daily basis uh, on the internet. Uh, we are very excited today uh, to have our first uh, transatlantic dialogue of 2020 uh, focused on intermediary liability um, I have as co-convener here, Lars Steffen, uh, who is international director over at ECHO, the Association of the Internet. Um, Lars, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, ECHO? Yes, thank you, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Also welcome from, from my end to the Transatlantic Dialogue on Intermediary Liability Part 1, The Internet Industry Speaks with the U.S. Um, as Christian just said, my name is Lars Steffen. I'm Director International at ECHO Association of the Internet Industry. And together with Christian Dawson, I'm your co-host for today's session. Um, according to the agenda, you may have expected Thomas Rickett filling my role, but um, due to um, an urgent case in this law firm, uh, he has to apologize uh, for this round table and sends his greetings to you. Um, just to give you a brief overview to um, the format of the transatlantic dialogues um, has been created already in 2018 and carry out the first time in 2019. And uh, back then we discussed the future of the privacy shield, which is actually a, a topic uh, that is even more relevant today, which it has been um, back then. And uh, I can say that we will pick up this topic uh, shortly again to discuss the, the current status uh, of this uh, thing. Um, the idea of, um, of the uh, collaboration between ITU Coalition and ECHO is um, to pick up topics which are relevant for members of both organizations on both sides of the Atlantic. And originally we organize um, on-site events in Brussels and the European Parliament in Berlin and also in Washington DC with high-level high representatives from the political arena to, to discuss these topics. Um, but due to the COVID-19 situation, we are having a virtual roundtable today. And I would like to welcome our guest speakers and everybody who logged in today to join our conversation. And I would like to thank I2 Coalition uh, to organize this virtual roundtable on intermediary liability in the US. The second part um, where we will focus on intermediary liability in the European Union will also be announced shortly. Uh, for those who have not heard much about ECO so far, so uh, with more than 1,100 members, ECO is Europe's largest association of the internet industry based in Germany and is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And um, we do have offices in Berlin, Cologne and Brussels and are the leading voice for internet infrastructure providers in Europe. Maybe you've heard of uh, Eco Subsidy, DKIX, the world's largest internet exchange point based in Frankfurt, which uh, today runs more than 20 exchange points around the globe, including New York and Dallas. And um, for more information on, on Echo and what we are doing, um, I will put a link to the chat uh, uh, shortly. And with this, um, I would like to hand over back to my co-host colleague, Christian Dawson, who will introduce you to today's topic uh, of this roundtable discussion. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lars. Uh, we are pleased to have four guest speakers with us today. Uh, our, our guest speakers include uh, Melinda Clem, who is on the board of directors, actually chairwoman of the board of directors of I2 Coalition. She is also vice president of strategy at Affiliates. Uh, we also have Oliver Sume, who is the chair of the board of ECHO, the Association of the Internet Industry, which you just learned a little bit about. Uh, we have David Sneed, who is uh, the co-founder of the I2 Coalition, as well as the general counsel for cPanel. 
Um, and finally, we have Adam Kandu, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information, U.S. Department of Commerce, NTIA. Uh, so a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, on the internet, generally a third party is always involved. Discussions around the responsibility uh, of that third party is a matter of determining liability in circumstances of real and perceived wrongdoing. Right now, intermediary laws, which widely originate in the early 2000s, are being reconsidered in both the United States and the European Union, specifically with plans to overhaul Section 230 of the Communications Decency in the United States, uh, Decency Act in the United States, and the process of building the Digital Services Act in the EU. Uh, the goal of this panel today is to speak with NTIA about the US perspective on the global ramifications of the current discussion and the upcoming proposals on both sides of the Atlantic rega regarding how the discussion of things like upload filters, algorithms, and extended liabilities for platforms will affect the growth of the internet economy, uh, barriers to trade, and the ability of the internet to continue to flourish as a tool that keeps us all connected. We're going to start uh, with opening statements from each of our guest speakers, and then we'll get into a small panel discussion with the remaining time that we have available. Uh, and we are happy to, um, to ask our first uh, speaker to be um, Acting Assistant Secretary uh, Adam Kandub. Um, Adam, would you uh, start us out today? Sure, and um, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Lars. Um, thank you to the um, IT Coalition. Um, this is a very interesting program and I'm honored and, and to be part of it and looking forward to the rest of it. Um, so, in the 1990s, um, as more and more Americans connected to the internet, um, there was a widespread recognition of how empowering the media could be. Um, no longer were mass communications limited to a few media companies, rather any American could connect and share his or her stories and viewpoints for the entire world. Um, gatekeepers were being pushed aside and people were sort of realizing um, a new sort of freedom um, that had never really been available, um, sort of, uh, Gutenberg raised to multiple um, uh, powers. Um, early internet platforms like AOL and Prodigy gave their users the ability to create um, their own content. Um, but of course, they, create, they faced in the United States crushing legal liabilities um, if their users' posts um, were somehow unlawful, if they're obscene or libelous or threatening. And those statements and, and, and material were attributed um, to the platforms themselves. Um, and under existing law, um, the courts ruled that they were. Um, the, those who control platforms and who make state and have statements upon them and therefore publish and disseminate them are legal, um, in, are liable uh, under American law for li um, certain types of, of legal um, liabilities which they face. So when Congress passed Section 230 as part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, its vision was straightforward. Um, to allow the, for the development of open forums, um, internet platforms must be protected from liability um, of, uh, for user-created content. Um, at the same time, um, uh, Section 230 granted pl platforms the ability to moderate user posts without assuming the liability that traditional publishers would face. Um, this is, of course, um, the conundrum that the famous Stratton Oakmont case um, presented. What happens when platforms decide to edit or curate um, user-generated content in order to make them remove obscene content, to um, remove threatening content, do they become publishers? Because of course they're editing, changing speech. And the Stratton Oakmont uh, court said, yes, you do. Um, Section 230 reversed that, but did so in a very limited way. It said only when a platform is editing for certain enumerated purposes, um, namely having to do with obscenity, um, uh, harassment, um, or um, uh, you know any objectionable content, um, referred to those other ideas. So it was it was it was an, it was a grant of of. Um, uh, uh, a release of legal liability when platforms edit, but only for very specific um, content. Um, and uh, so therefore, uh, the, um, but this original vision I think has been changed a lot. Um, 
Uh, the emergence and consolidation of social media companies has meant a handful of platforms now dominate um, a huge amount of, of discourse, not only in the United States, but across the world. Um, with the backing of well-funded legal teams, these platforms have leaned on ambiguities of Section 230 to argue that they have complete immunity for any decisions they make about content. They have shaped events to fit certain narratives, deleted or otherwise disappeared information without notice, and exercise a tremendous control over what people see and do not see. Um, these platforms, among the biggest corporations in the world, say they can do this and still not face the legal implications of a traditional publisher. They can edit, they can change, they can promote, they can shape ideas, but they are not, in fact, publishing or speaking anything. Um, in recent um, years, these dominant social media platforms have felt increasingly emboldened to alter, comment, or remove users' content. And it is a sad irony that a law meant to promote openness on the internet um, instead has delivered online speech into the, into the care of private censors, leaving many silenced. In May, with um, this state of affairs in mind, President Trump issued his executive order on preventing online censorship. In the order, President Trump was unequivocal in his commitment to free and open debate on the internet, but he raised several troubling threats to this ideal. He pointed out that users of major social media services have been reporting that their posts have been flagged as inappropriate, despite not violating any terms of service. Without explanations, platforms have made changes to their policies to disfavor certain viewpoints. And some have even placed warning labels over users' posts in a manner that clearly reflects political bias. The President's order sought increased transparency and accountability from online platforms. The goal of the administration is to protect and preserve the integrity of American public discussion. The order also tasked NTIA with petitioning the Federal Communications Commission to clarify Section 230's ambiguities and return it to its original purpose, to encourage openness and allow for content moderation in service of creating a welcoming, um, in the service of creating a welcoming and opening environment to all voices. In our petition, we asked the FCC use its authorities to make three things clear with regard to Section 230 and intermediate liability. First, Section 230 requires social media companies to abide by their own moderation policies and contractual obligations. It doesn't offer immunity to those seeking in court to um, keep, um, uh, to um, require it, the platforms to um, essentially um, stay true to their promises and contractual obligations. Two, Section 230 deems social media firms to be publishers when they remove, promote, comment upon, or edit user content. Um, obviously, if they did, did such things in any other context, they would be publishers and would have liability for those statements that they make or delete or change or alter and which they attribute to themselves. The same rule should be um, on the internet. Um, Section 230 doesn't change that. Third, Section 230 does not protect a social media platform that shapes and controls its overall content according to a discernible viewpoint. When a, any platform becomes essentially an engine for the propagation of a particular point of view, it can be reasonably said that the entire, the entire social media, is a media um, platform is in fact a form of expression. If it's a form of expression, then the platform is a speaker. If, it is, if he, the platform is a speaker, then it falls outside of 230 protection. Um, the petition also asked the FCC to impose disclosure requirements similar to those that broadband service providers like AT&T and Verizon now face. Um, this disclosure provides the oversight mechanisms for other regulation proposed. Taken as a whole, if the FCC acts on our petition, Section 230 once again would protect freedom of expression while holding dominant platforms accountable for their editorial decisions. Uh, before I turn things over to the panel, I would like to address two critiques of our petition. Um, that have emerged um, since we sent it to the FCC. Um, the first is that somehow the FCC doesn't have authority to promulgate these rules um, to resolve ambiguities in Section 230. Um, I think that that argument has been um, presented to the Supreme Court twice, and both times the Supreme Court says the FCC does have authority. Um, Section 201 of the Communications Act, 201B, um, is, gives plenary authority to the FCC to implement regulations to clarify any section um, of the um, 1934 Act. Um, 203, uh, two, excuse me, 230 was codified into the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which was then codified into the 1934 Act. 
um, the, the, the Supreme Court on two occasions has upheld this analysis. Second, there is this idea that somehow the First Amendment would prevent this, that somehow we're introducing a new fairness doctrine. Um, again, this is, this is a, a, a red herring. Um, uh, no one has a First Amendment right to Section 230 protections. They are a gift to the um, to, to, to individuals, and 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 the, and the government has the authority to shape this liability relief in any way that it deems appropriate. Um, and there is no viewpoint discrimination here, and they're not favoring any particular viewpoints. They're just saying that platforms, like anyone else, like newspapers, like um, anyone who who like booksellers or, or bookstores um, must be liable for the promises they make um, and the speech and, and, and public publications um, that they issue. Um, so that's all I have to say and uh, looking forward to um, uh, comments and, and reactions from the panelists. Thank you. Adam, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for providing an overview on intermediary liability regime and the current status of the discussion on section uh, 2030 in the US. Um, with this, I would like to hand over to Melinda Clem um, for the first introductory statement uh, of our further speakers. Melinda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Adam. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Melinda Clem. I work for Affilias, the world's second largest domain registry. Um, Excited for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we do um, as an internet infrastructure company. But I want to be clear that today when I'm talking to you, although I might use the first person uh, to give you specifics about both our operational model and our business model and the things that we do today, um, in general, uh, the descriptions apply to our sector at large. You should see these as illustrative examples and not one company with one agenda. We realize that the role we play um, in the internet is important, but equally important is how we operate with other companies, with how we operate and the expectations that are put on us from our users, whether they're government, public sector, private sector, or just citizens, residents in general. And we take those things seriously. We pride ourselves in doing our jobs and doing them well. And they are predominantly technical jobs. Ours is community that, as Christian explains, we're sitting in the middle of other technical companies and other companies that are providing technical services. Our teams are largely engineers. They're network engineers, security engineers, and analysts. Okay, we don't employ people that are uh, working on content that are content creators, and nor do we typically employ people who are reviewing content because uh, we are not a content creator. We also do not, as part of our business models, uh, manipulate, edit, uh, content in any way. Uh, we also, as a matter of course, do not prioritize any content. We, we, we aren't in the business of making money of ranking the content we have. We provide services. Those services are provided uniformly uh, to all of our customers. We don't tend to say, okay, we've sold you this domain name or this website. Now we're gonna treat you special. No, everyone is given the same high quality of service. We protect your data. We try to make sure that everything is secure at every point in the service delivery as possible. Um, because those are the areas where we focus. This is our business model and this is how we operate. Despite this, despite that we are often steps away uh, from content generation, uh, we do realize that there is inappropriate content out there, content that falls outside um, the protected free speech that we have here in the United States under the First Amendment. And this type of objectionable content, um, we have terms of services, we have AUPs, and we benefit and we appreciate the protection that we have under Section 230 today to remove such damaging and offensive material. Those are the protections that we are eager to stay in place and to protect the, the business and operating model that we have today. 
um, and not and to avoid any unintended consequences that could happen when we break down those protections we have today. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, um, we appreciate those uh, um, perspectives greatly. Uh, this is a transatlantic dialogue, and it's very important that we pull in the European perspective. For that, we turn to our colleague Oliver. Oliver, can you uh, share your thoughts? Thank you very much, Christian, and uh, Lars, for hosting this event today. Yes, and in indeed, as um, many of you know, intermediate liability has always been one of the cornerstones for the European internet industry for many years. Um, it has its roots in the so-called e-commerce directive um, back from the year 2000. So um, not as old as, as the um, act in the US, um, but um, at least 20 years in place now. And um, we have a very vibrant discussion currently in Europe about um, a revision of the intermediate liability system from the e-commerce directive because we all saw in the last 20 years that the internet has developed. We saw, um, as also Adam pointed out, um, a number of new kind of services coming up and in particular, the role of online and social media platforms um, has become of more and more social, um, but also economic importance and online platforms um, are nothing that at least specifically would be addressed by um, the liability regime under the e-commerce directive. Um, and what we saw in Europe in the last 20 years was not only a lot of development in terms of the internet and its services and um, the value chain itself, um, but of course also uh, a very interesting development with regard to um, a more and more specific legal framework in particular on the European level. Um, and also um, a huge number of um, verdicts of national high courts, but also in particular of the European high court dealing with the question of intermediate liability and in particular to what extent um, providers have to be liable um, for content of third parties. And all these uh, developments in the last 20 years led to a pretty unclear situation um, um, depending on the business model and the liability question um, leading to um, a huge um, legal uncertainty for many players. Um, we also saw coming up more and more other European directives as well as national laws in Europe that were dealing with intermediate liability and well that led to a pretty fragmented situation. Um, the e-commerce directive itself basically had a very good approach because it has a horizontal approach. It doesn't refer to a special um, infringement um, of a right, but the liability system um, would apply um, to uh, hate speech, um, to trademark infringements, to competition infringements. So this horizontal approach was, um, I think, a very um, smart step and an innovation friendly way um, of um, setting out this liability framework. And we saw that um, disappearing more and more in the last years because a number of special verdicts and a number of, as I said, um, further legislative approaches were trying to tackle the question of liability um, more on a vertical basis relating to certain activities or to um, specific um, infringements, for example, in terms of copyright, as we recently saw from the um, revision of the European copyright legal framework. So all this um, led to, um, well, a new approach. And um, I think Christian, you already mentioned is it, uh, the um, European Commission is working on a so-called Digital Services Act and um, amongst many other aspects, the um, DSA will also revise the intermediate liability system here in Europe. Um, we only last week, I think, or two weeks ago, saw first leaks of working papers from the commission setting out a number of options, um, but um, we um, have not seen a first official um, draft for the 
liability part in the Digital Services Act so far. From an industry perspective, um, we, we do see the need um, to deal explicitly with online platforms. We believe it would make sense to um, introduce a new category of services and define their role in terms of liability. Um, however, we also think it's very important to stick to the categories that we already have in the e-commerce directive for hosting provider services, which still um, have, of course, its meaning. Um, we all know cloud services um, of all kinds are becoming more and more important um, for the economy as a whole. And against that background, we think it's very important to um, revise, yes, to find uh, some new solutions for new services, um, but also um, to um, um, to retain what we what we already have in the e-commerce directive. And there are a number of um, further aspects, of course, that we would like to see or not to see um, in the future legislation, but that can be subject maybe to our discussion or to the questions of the audience. Thank you. Oliver, thank you very much for the overview of what's going on in Europe. With this, I would like to hand over to David. David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lars. Uh, uh, I'm David Sneed, and I'm general counsel for cPanel. cPanel is based in Houston, and we're part of a group of companies that has offices in the EU, Switzerland, and Russia. So I work on global issues, uh, including content impacting dissemination issues, which is one of the reasons that I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, our companies, cPanel and Plesk, really could be considered to be part of the yarn that holds the fabric of the internet together, kind of using the analogy that Christian uh, used at the top of the, the call. And I really am thankful to the I2 Coalition and Echo and Christian and Lars for the opportunity to speak today and also to um, Secretary Candela for, for being on the call today. You know, I've been working on internet infrastructure issues since 1995, which is probably why I have a lot of gray hair. Um, but, you know, I started working out on internet issues back when all encryption was export controlled and you had to have a license to add encryption to your networks. And I worked on a project where uh, a very large company was trying to network their global ports, and it was very, very difficult. But you know, then as now, um, when I look at the internet, I see growth and opportunity. And my viewpoint of the internet really contrasts with what's coming out now from those who look at the internet and really all they see is trouble, and problems and the internet is the bad side of town that needs fixing and cleaning and, and renovation. And you know, I hear the concern about large companies and I really do understand that concern, but it's important to point out that Google is not the internet. Facebook is not the internet. Most of the companies who are involved in the internet don't have lobbyists and neither, we don't have lobbyists and neither do the vast majority of our customers. We have large, large numbers of customers who are paying under $20 a month. And this is the evidence of small businesses running the internet. You know, when I look at this problem, I think about my colleagues at cPanel and Plesk who are developers. When developers find a bug in their code, they fix it. They don't unplug the entire network to deal with that bug. And it's this statement, you don't unplug the entire internet to deal with a bug in your code that really brings me uh, to, to the discussion we're having today. It's not putting too fine a point on this discussion to say, the proposals to change Section 230 are akin to unplugging a network to fix a bug. And there's a second point that I want to push back on. I want to push back on the concept that Section 230 is a gift to the industry. Section 230 is not a gift to our industry. Section 230 re responded to troubling decisions in the law that would impact our businesses in ways that couldn't have been anticipated. Internet infrastructure providers are not platforms. 
the concerns that have been proposed up and the changes that have been proposed to Section 230 impact our businesses in ways that will not impact Google and Facebook and other large platforms. Neither cPanel, our customers or our users are platforms, we're networks. Applying standards that are being used to address problems with large platforms who themselves are not homogenous will significantly disrupt or if not poison our business. And so while I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to be on this, on this uh, discussion, I really hope that this is a discussion about the difference between platform regulation and network regulation. And I think having a discussion like that will really lead to some positive policy developments uh, that will make all of our lives be better. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, David, for your statement. And thanks to all of our guest speakers to, for, for giving us an opening perspective on on where you are coming from uh, regarding intermediary liability and the conversations that are happening right now. Uh, the conversation that you're looking to have, I believe is a conversation that we can have as we step into our two discussion questions, which we're going to jump into. Uh, I will go ahead and read our first discussion question in a moment. I'm thinking that we ought to uh, relatively use the same uh, format of going person by person that we did before, assuming that everybody has uh, something that they wish to contribute for each question. Uh, the first question that I'm going to ask uh, regard is regarding exactly what it is you were talking about, David. Uh, and, and so let's go ahead and, and get into it. And, uh, and Adam, if it's okay, I'll ask you to, to be our first uh, uh, respondent to this one. Um, Section 230 reform efforts seem to focus on the role of social media platforms. How does reform stand to affect the internet infrastructure providers specifically? Yes, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll respond. Uh, I think that um, respond to, to David's point, um, which is uh, well taken. Um, again, Section 230 only applies to interactive computer services. It's a defined term. Um, these are individuals who essentially provide our, our platforms to take content from other content, internet content providers. Um, and so I'm not, I, I don't quite understand and I'd be interested to learn more about the concern um, from the um, providers of, you know, the lower levels of the internet, um, exactly how Section 230 is, is so vital to, um, you know, how they do their business. Um, I think that um, any regulation um, would be, you know, focused toward the higher levels because that's what the statute requires of us. Um, furthermore, um, you know, the idea that simply, um, you know, metaphors like, oh, if you change this, you know, you'll pull the plug from the internet and, and our lives will be, you know, miserable and wretched and we'll have to, you know, read books again, God forbid. Um, uh, the, um, you know, that, Nobody wants to do that, um, but at the same time, we do, as as, as um, Oliver recognized, have to recognize have to recognize the obvious, which is that um, the internet plays a role that was in, in our lives that is far more pervasive, far, far more powerful than was ever conceived of in 1996 when the sec when Section 230 was was passed. Um, the call for liability um, that is not just in America but in Europe. Um, you know, recognizes that there is a vacuum, it's going to be filled somehow. Um, and this sort of hot potato attitude um, that, oh, you know, don't, don't make us liable, send it to somebody else. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that will really bring the ball forward because this is a problem that societies will require a solution to, and we all have to work together um, to, to make that happen. Melinda? Um, as I mentioned in, in my opening remarks, one of the protections that we feel that we have, and we can get into this a little bit later, is the ability to enforce terms of services for, uh, let's just call it objectionable content, content that is uh, not protected speech. Um, and, and that's something that we're eager to continue to do. Um, we, we don't want that out there more than, than anyone else. Um, I wanna be clear, we don't feel like we, um, are making money and being profitable on things like that. Um, overall, we realize that our business model does well 
when there is trust in the internet. And trust is, um, can be defined any number of ways, but it really has to do with do people feel secure in visiting these sites and what they're doing. And that, that general activity is how we would measure trust. So uh, we, we wanna make sure that we have the ability to deal with that um, and to deal with it without uh, frivolous, endless lawsuits. As I had mentioned, and, and, and we've, you've heard here, you know, we're largely, especially at the I2 Coalition, small and medium-sized businesses, right? Uh, we're the backbone of the US economy, but we're small. Uh, my company in particular, as I mentioned, we're, we're the second largest registry, um, but we've got about 250 people. Uh, to put that in some context, right? We have less than, than 180 people in our technology unit um, that have to do all the things that we do to keep all 20 plus million domain names running and available 100% of the time. We do that with these folks. When we, attribute dollars to innovation and time and money to R&D, we focus on efforts that, again, within the scope of what we're doing uh, to protect, secure the internet, to protect the data, to protect people's privacy, to protect the interests of, and then make certain that all of this content is um, found as expeditiously as possible, because that's where we want to spend our money. That's the best thing for our industry and for the economy is if our innovation, our money is spent on innovation like that, not taking us outside of our realm and, and trying to figure out how to license AI and manage content. This is where we want to focus. So if you look at this, you know, sort of big picture, it's about how do we allocate our resources? And it's do we allocate our resources to make the internet secure and to make it stronger and, and to provide more trust to people? Or do we prioritize lawsuits and issues that represent a minuscule fraction of what happens on our systems? Oliver, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I can contribute to that of course, more from a European perspective. Um, I already mentioned some of the principles that we currently have in um, the e-commerce directive, um, but uh, maybe this is um, a good opportunity um, to, to speak about um, additional requirements that we see for any kind of intermediate liability in the future. Um, I will give you one example that, that strikes me very much and that I think is um, a very key question to any future legislation in that regard. We have seen the development in the last years in, in Europe that more and more shifts um, the decisions that should be made by courts or investigations that should be made by official law enforcement authorities to the private sector. We have seen many laws um, on a national, but also on European level directives that put service providers and online platforms in the position where they have to decide about what people will see or not see or uh, hear or not hear on the internet. And um, if it comes to a situation like that, uh, we um, really see a conflict of very fundamental interest, right? We have, of course, um, the freedom of speech, um, the freedom of impression, um, but on the other hand, should not private companies put in a position where they have to decide about what people can upload, um, how people comment on certain um, topics on the internet, because I think that should um, stay in the hands of courts um, of um, law enforcement agencies and should not be in the hands um, of private companies. And that is a development that, that we saw in a number of cases, um, where at the same time, um, in particular in Germany, but I think also in other European countries, for example, law enforcement agencies are not in the position at all to investigate in criminal acts on the internet in terms of cybersecurity, because they just don't have the manpower. They, in many cases, don't have the technology to do so. And that leads to a, a very unbalanced um, result and very unbalanced situation. Um, and again, that, that um, is a very bad development that more and more private companies um, are having 
to make these very fundamental decisions. That is something that I think we should keep in mind if we discuss about a new liability regime for the future. Um, and also the current um, e-commerce directive um, has the so-called um, no monitoring principle. It explicitly says that internet service providers do not have the obligation to actively monitor um, content that they host for third parties in order to um, assess if there is illegal or illicit um, content on their network. And that is a principle that, well, has been weakened as well um, with a number of new laws in the last years. And I think it's um, very important to keep that in mind, that we stick to this principle um, and to do not enter into a regime where continuous and active monitoring um, by hosting companies of all kind um, would be uh, a, um, a legal uh, obligation. We will move on to David. After we do, I uh, will leave it up to Adam whether you want to quickly respond uh, to any of the comments from our panelists before we move on to our final question. So David? Sure. Thanks, Christian. And um, I do appreciate um, the uh, uh, Adam's uh, comments. Um, I, 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 I certainly don't mean to suggest that, um, that reading is not a, not a good idea. Um, but um, so, you know, Section 230, and, and maybe this will help facilitate a dialogue, Section 230 really uh, underlies uh, a great deal of our liability planning. Uh, and our, our understanding of where um, internet infrastructure's liabilities may be. So the, your, um, your discussion about what the definitional impacts of Section 230 might be are um, a, a little bit, they're, they're, that's a little bit of a new understanding for me. It might be helpful uh, for this discussion for me to break down how our ecosystem works, at least from the, the uh, cPanel point of view from starting a business. So, you know, the way we look at it is you have a website, you use your ISP to transmit the content of your website to a host. Let's say that host is Bluehost. Uh, Bluehost has servers, bandwidth, people, technology, and software that helps you do things like have a web presence, process mail, sell goods, collect payment. You might have a community that you've created around your product. Uh, and then from, from our perspective, Bluehost uses cPanel and WHM for many of these things, particularly around automating your mail and the technical aspects of getting your site online. So let's say someone doesn't like your site because you're selling merchandise that's controversial. Some of the proposed changes in Section 230 are going to create liability for your ISP, who, does, who fails to stop you from transmitting your site to Bluehost, Bluehost for providing services to you for hosting the controversial merchandise, Bluehost bandwidth providers who will stop providing bandwidth to Bluehost because they're also transmitting the data, payment processors to stop collecting funds to make the sale, and then to cPanel who's licensed the software to Bluehost to license to you. What Section 230 does is it allows all of these folks to investigate, and if they determine a claim is valid, take action or not without liability. It really encourages proactivity. Uh, changes to Section 230 will simply require the entire chain to take a claim at face value, lest they be liable. And any break in this chain is gonna stop the transaction. And I'm not speaking hypothetically, I'm actually speaking from our practical, from our day-to-day -day experience. Using cPanel as an example, um, we get from time to time requests that we disable software that allows you to process your mail um, and to take down a license because someone alleges that what one of our customers is doing violates a law. If we terminate that license, the site goes dark and really there's no recourse. An entire site goes down from that. I would rather be in a position where I have the opportunity to do some investigation, to look into the claim without really worrying about me uh, my company having liability 
for failing to take down a website where we have a vague allegation uh, that they're doing something illegal. So that's kind of, I, I think, where the discussion is right now about internet infrastructure providers and kind of how the ecosystem works. And I'd be interested, um, quite honestly, in, in, in a further discussion about this, either now or uh, sometime in the future. Adam, do you wish to address um, any of the commenters or should we move on to the last question? No, I'd be delighted to. Um, and I, I would very much look forward to um, uh, um, um, talking, um, uh, talking with David and Melinda and others about this, um, uh, as well as Oliver. Um, so it's interesting you point that out. I mean, the question is, oh, if there's, a, as you said, a vague allegation of illegality, you'll have to take something down. Um, unfortunately, you know, under current, you know, Section 230 interpretations by the courts, you know, we've gone to the other extreme. So I'm thinking of the Bird v. Hassel case, where a court adjudged a, a content to be unlawful and illegal and issued an order to um, the platform instructing it to take down. And the Supreme Court of California said, oh, no, 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 Section 230 doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that a court has a judge content to be unlawful. It doesn't matter that um, it's simply enforcing its, its order. Section 230 essentially provides immunity to that. So, you know, I, I agree there is a, a line to be drawn um, and I'm interested in creating a good line. Um, but what we have in Section 230 is, is when, you know, a, a state court duly adjudges um, content to be unlawful and it serves as a shield to prevent the, the taking down of that unlawful content, um, we've gone too far. And I, I, I think we, you know, this is, this is a problem. Um, uh, uh, and I, you know, th that we have to think about. Um, and um, going to uh, Melinda's point um, about otherwise objectionable, one of the things the petition does is it does limit that term um, to Congress's real intent, which was, um, you know, to regulate, um, you know, traditional forms of um, um, objectionable media content, nudity, harassing telephone calls, things like that. Um, Again, I, mean, I agree with you. I mean, it certainly makes life for businesses if you know they can refuse content, refuse service, uh, stop service um, uh, to anyone for any reason. Um, but is that the intent of Section Two Hundred and Thirty? I don't know. Um, and more important, you know, our, our communications networks from the nineteenth century onward um, have relied upon a notion of openness. I mean, I think that's essential for, for democracy is that we have to have platforms where people feel able, whoever they are, whether you know, they're communists or whether they're Satanists or whether you know, they have whatever point of view where they can come and interact as equals in a democratic context. Um, and so um, to give power to certain gatekeepers to say, oh, you may be part of the public discourse, but you may not. Um, I think is, is, is troubling and I think we as a society have to work through the ramifications of what that power means and what a proper um, legal reaction to it. Uh, thank you, Adam, for, for your comments on this. And I'm happy to see that we already set um, the foundation for uh, further exchange um, and of, of thoughts and ideas on this. Um, nevertheless, I would like to come to our second question. I would like to ask our uh, panelists um, and to keep their um, answers quite short because we're already in 10 minutes um, um, uh, uh, before the top of the hour. That's so my fault. I'm sorry. I'm talking to no, you. No, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no. I'm, I'm glad to see that we have a, have a good conversation. Um, so this is the second question to you. Um, Europe is also looking at reform of its intermediary liability frameworks. What can be done to ensure that reform efforts end up facilitating transatlantic trade? Adam, if, if you would like to. Yeah, sure. To... Well, you know, importantly, you know, Section 230 has been part of, um, you know, many of our, our um, international trade agreements. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, not Section 230, but similar. I, I didn't mean that. I misspoke. Um, intermediate li liability protections. Um, I think that the strategy going forward um, will be very successful um, to, you know, to create, you know, harmonized systems um, between, you know, national approaches. So, you know, I, I think that's a very, very positive development going forward. Thank you very much. Belinda. Yeah, as an operator, I, I, 
I also um, desire that sort of consistency. Uh, one of the problems that um, companies have, especially you know, new entrants into a market, is understanding you know, what exactly is the, the entire ecosystem. Um, the best we can come together and solidify definitions, standards, um, the, the easier it's going to be for new companies to start, for existing companies to operate and understand the rules with which they operate. So what um, I'd like to see is, is some sort of commonality there so that we can get to um, you know, the closest possible legal standard that would be uniform. Um, for internet, you know, for intermediary liability from core definitions like the discussion that we've been having, who's included, um, at, at what layer um, are certain expectations. Um, that sort of definition um, is something we'd like to see. Thank you, Melinda. Oliver. Yes, I can only echo what Melinda just said. I think it, it's very important to to have a look at the at the other side um, from 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 the relevant uh, perspectives and and uh, see and take into consideration how um, things are developing um, in terms of um, improvement of the liability system um, and well fundamental differences are always difficult to handle for for industries. Um, we see that in many cases. I mean, um, it's a completely different topic, but the GDPR um, has become uh, an example for how much burden it can be for, in particular, for companies outside Europe um, to comply with the European standards um, if they have a completely different um, framework and system for data protection and privacy. Um, and with regard to, to liability, I mean, there are more similarities um, um, of course, uh, as with regard um, to privacy and data protection, but um, it would be very wise to at least have the same understanding to, to the fundamental principles of, of safe harbors and of um, secondary liability um, for, for certain service provider and platforms. Thank you, Oliver. David, would you like to comment on this? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief and I'll, kind of, I'll, I'll echo a bit what um, Oliver is saying. I think that this is a good question. And certainly as a business who's owned by investors in Europe and uh, whose sister company is based in Russia, um, this, is, this is important to us. I think reform efforts um, would, I think actually the, the efforts that we're talking about would be good to use Privacy Shield as an example. Uh, while I know that Privacy Shield is difficult right now, uh, what Privacy Shield shows is how the US and the EU and Switzerland can work together to meet the needs of our different uh, constituencies and systems. And, you know, honestly, more than that, I think um, we need to stop seeing different approaches to the same problem as necessarily bad. Um, Privacy Shield shows that the, the US and the EU can work together on frameworks that will accommodate um, differences in kind of cultural approaches to problems uh, and standards. And I don't see why, why this should be any different. David, thank you very much. So there are only five minutes left. And um, I would like to say that uh, running out of time is uh, or, always a good sign of, uh, of a good conversation. And um, I think um, this is already a, a good um, a foundation for um, further exchange of thoughts and ideas on, on this topic um, um, between the NTA, Adam, and, um, and the industry. My key takeaways have been that we have to have a take a closer look at the internet industry as a vital ecosystem so that there are different players with different roles on the market and that there are always new players coming in in the future as we've seen uh, in the past and right now so that we have to create frameworks that are always adaptive um, for, for the industry that is evolving and developing and that we always have to take a look at that um, we have always um, the, the feeling within the industry that there is, might be um, a shift of re responsibility that's going from law enforcement to the private sector. And this is, uh, I think, something that we have to have an eye on um, and have to have the, the discussion and, and common ground when we uh, develop um, uh, legal frameworks in the US and in the European Union in the, in the forthcoming future. 
And um, with this, I would like to hand over to, to Christian um, to, to ask him what are his, his key takeaways and uh, his thoughts and ideas on this. Thank you very much. From, thank you, Lars, and thank you to our panelists. Uh, my biggest takeaway is that our path forward is through continued open dialogue. Uh, we are right now uh, engaged in a dialogue that was fantastic, but it is just the tip of the iceberg and the conversations that we need in order to identify potential unintended consequences and to figure out how we can close the gap on them as people look to address problems online. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful to uh, Adam um, for his actively saying, I'd like to speak more with our panelists. Uh, I'm hopeful that there are uh, additional points of continued dialogue and education that we can take uh, out of this environment um, as we seek to illustrate the complexity of the, um, of the overall ecosystem and the, uh, and the intermediary protections that are uh, vital to ensuring uh, the continued uh, thriving of the internet as a whole so that we can, um, again, close the gaps on any unintended consequences before they hit. Um, and I'm committed to making sure that our organization is a facilitator in that process. And so uh, our biggest takeaway is that, you know, our work on this, our big work ahead of this, on this is ahead of us. Um, and we'll continue to open doors and convene and make sure that with our partners at ECHO, we have the conversations that we need to uh, make sure that the right, hap the right things happen for the internet to survive and thrive. We're reaching the end of our program today. Uh, I wanna really thank all of our panelists here for your, your time and attention. Um, eager for us to continue these conversations. Uh, thanks to our attendees. Uh, for coming and uh, and dialoguing with us, uh, for listening to us talk about these esoteric things uh, that mean a lot. Um, and I wish you all the best for the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, very much. Kristen. Thanks, Lars. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone.